My name is Nadia Ali. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies here at Brown. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's event. We will be talking about our Thinking Palestine via Ferguson and Standing Rock, Radical Kinship and the Intersectionality of Struggles. The panel is organized by our current Mahmoud Darwish Visiting Fellow in Palestinian Studies, Professor Ruba Saleh. Professor Saleh is professor at the Department of Anthropology and Sociology at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, at the University of London. Her research interests and writing cover transnational migration and diasporas across Europe, the Middle East and North Africa, Islam and gender, the Palestine question and refugees. She has been a visiting scholar at the University of Cambridge and at the University of Venice, Car Foscari. Um, Professor Saleh is author of Gender and Transnationalism, Home, Longing and Belonging Among Moroccan Migrant Women and of Musulman Revelate, Donne Islam Modernita. Um, Professor Saleh has uh, published widely on Palestine, Palestinian refugees, um, has edited a number of special issues Welcome, Ruba. It's lovely to have you here. And you've invited uh, two guests. I'm, I'm really happy to welcome first Lubna Katami, who is an assi assistant professor in the Department of Asian American Studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. Lubna is a former president's postdoctoral fellow from the Department of Ethnic Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Her research examines transnational Palestinian youth movements after the 1993 Oslo Accords through the 2011 Arab uprisings. Her work is based on scholar activist ethnographic research methods and her broader scholarly interests include Palestine, critical refugee studies, the radical racialization of Arab Muslim communities in the US, settler colonialism, youth movements, transnationalism and indigenous and third world feminism. Lubna was the founder, a co-founder of the Palestinian Youth Movement, PYM, and is currently a member of the Palestinian Feminist Collective. Welcome, Lubna. And I'm also really happy to um, welcome Miriam Awak, who is a Dutch Moroccan anthropologist. She's a reader, which is um, associate professor in the US system at the Communication and Media Research Institute, University of Westminster. She's the author of the book, Palestine Online, and the forthcoming Mediating the Mahzan. Her research and writings focus on grassroots movements, digital politics, and revolutions, counter-revolutions. Her work is published in several books and journals, including her own monograph, Palestine Online. And since 2000, 2011, she follows and writes about the complex revolutionary dynamics in the Arab world with special interest in the impact of the internet. Welcome, everyone. So I'm going to hand over to Professor Ruba Saleh for the conversation, and I'll join you back later. So we have time for Q&A. Um, so I'd like you all who participate um, on the webinar to please put in your comments or your questions in the Q&A function, and we should have half an hour towards the end for discussion. Thank you. Over to you, Ruba. Thank you very much, Nadia, and uh, thank you, Barbara, for <clears throat> helping organizing this event, which we were very much looking forward to, um, to have, and uh, in particular, uh, Miriam and Lubna for accepting this invitation. And I have to say that uh, more than guests, uh, both uh, Lubna and Miriam have been um, highly inspirational for me in, um, in different times and <laughs> with, through their different uh, um, sort of intergenerational journeys uh, as scholars and activists uh, who I look very much upon when thinking about my own work. So I'm, I'm very honored and, and happy to, that they have ac accepted to participate into this panel. Uh, I would just like to, um, to spend a few minutes by um, going to the very framing of this event which of course is titled Thinking Palestine uh, via um, Ferguson and Standing Rock. And it, um, 
particularly features as the subtitle, the notion of intersectionality, intersectional struggles and uh, radical kinship. So I would like to just have a few minutes to introduce our audience to the, to the topic and to what we are looking to do here. So basically, what does it mean to think of Palestine by a Standing Rock and Ferguson? First of all, I think it is a form of acknowledgement and, and, and a way of thanking um, for the offerings of the struggles and communities um, at Standing Rock and the Black Lives Movement, amongst others, and the wish um, to make visible the particular kinds of generative intersectional practices of solidarity that have contributed um, to our way of rethinking Palestine over the last uh, few years. There is, of course, a context um, in which our reckoning with what it means to think about Palestine today within this context um, is, is, is happening. It, there is a context in which um, um, the manifestation, the current manifestation of the nation state project or, um, is unfolding um, uh, in front of our eyes uh, and with it, it's the, the limits of the national liberation project. Um, we are living at a time when Palestine is being seen or represented conveniently as a state or quasi-state when, when, when is needed on the one hand, but while Palestinians are continuing to experience the reality of the occupation with its historical and ongoing forms of dispossession, displacement, extraction and destruction from homes to nature on the ground. There is heightened and novel level of normalization of the ethnic and racial discriminations that Palestinians in Israel have suffered from, which has been finally sanctioned uh, in, the, in, in the most clear way in the 2018 basic state law or the law that defines Israel as the state of its Jewish people only, uh, which basically sees a culmination of a long-term process of de-indigenization of the Palestinian people. So this is the context where First of all, we need to, we are urged to rethink Palestine through Standing Rock and Ferguson. But similarly, there is also a, a sense in which Palestine is being reconfigured beyond its national horizons and has become central, central um, in global struggles for justice around the world. Not only Palestine is central for detecting and analyzing the reorganization of power, of surveillance, of capital, of private profits into, in these neoliberal times, but it also is a crucial knot within which these transnational fields or assemblages are occurring. It, was, it is well documented, for example, how, for instance, arms which have been battle tested in Gaza increased their profitability on the global market. And examples of the export of Israeli technologies of surveillance and of their bordering, bordering techniques abound in the scholarship and the activist scholarship too. There is, however, a third uh, point of view that needs to be uh, brought to the to the forum here, um, which is that Palestine features today as a potent signifier within global sites of struggles against settler colonial extraction, dispossession, and racial injustice. And starting out our event by remembering uh, or by paying homage to Mini Kony's wrapping uh, in the Palestinian kufia of her newborn baby. Um, at the palace, at, at this Dakota pipeline um, struggle site is actually a way of paying really homage to, to the indigenous struggles at Standing Rock, but it also allows us to situate the various ways in which, in which thinking Palestine through Standing Rock and Ferguson are crucial beyond what one can infer as a process of fetishization or symbol or mere symbolism. Um, similarly, the image of George Floyd, or the, the excruciatingly painful image of George Floyd breathlessness while being brutally murdered by police violence, also offers itself to much more than being seen as a metaphor. The impossibility to breathe is what brings together experiences of Palestinians in crammed refugee camps over generations, of migrants literally suffocating under trucks while they in, engage in dangerous journeys across impenetrable borders of life under occupation, but it also points to global racial hierarchies in access to oxygen or to air, quite literally. 
So indigeneity has given Palestinians a frame to think of their experiences of settler colonial violence and erasure in Palestine as a form of dispossession that aims at displacing the indigenous and replacing them. It has offered a horizon to rethink the Palestinian struggle as an anti-colonial struggle. So thinking Palestine as a struggle for indigeneity expands the imaginaries of liberation that the nation state um, project has afforded us, us with. And the scholarship and practices of movements such as Black Lives Matter um, are crucial as they allow us to bring in the notion of the constant struggle to quote um, Angela Davis or the way she put it. That is that liberation as the project that goes beyond national self-determination, but requires class, gender, and race, among other axes, to be acknowledged as crucial and intersecting axes of identity and of oppression. I just don't want to spend too much time, but I, I, I can't help but reminding ourselves of how the current war unfolding today in Ukraine has powerfully made evident, if we needed this more, that compliance with international law, for example, for example is subject to very profound racialized logics and that the law is primarily invoked when the victims are European whites. A process that was defined in a recent article in terms of um, race, racist gaslighting of the people of Iraq, Palestine, Syria, and Afghanistan, among others. So this is um, what I offer as a um, entering into our discussion today and as a um, food for thought for continuing the conversation. And we'd like now to open um, uh, the floor to Miriam and to Lubna. And I would like particularly to hear about uh, their own reflections on what does it mean to think Palestine by a standing rock and Ferguson, and particularly thinking through the specifics of their own work, which has been so inspirational and so important for my own. Thank you. Maybe uh, Miriam, do you want to start? Go ahead, Lubna. <laughs> I don't want to be. Lubna. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much to uh, Ruba and Maryam for joining me in this conversation, Nadia, Barbara, and everyone else who made this event uh, possible. I'm really um, thrilled to be here today. Um, I, I really appreciate your opening remarks, Ruba. I think that they frame a lot of the questions that we've been grappling with um, really well. And I think, you know, when I think of Palestine through Standing Rock and Ferguson, I think the first thing that I would want to say that I think is really important is that when we talk about the Palestinian presence or solidarity at Standing Rock or with Ferguson, um, it didn't come out of a vacuum. Like we all have recognized the long histories of internationalism, cooperation between Black and Indigenous struggles with the Palestinians. Um, but we also know that there's a new generation who are actively working to retrieve those histories, learning about cross-movement solidarities, the literary exchanges and oral history testimonies of native Palestinian and black Palestinian thinkers, artists, and public intellectuals. And for a group like the Palestinian youth movement, who I'll be focusing a little bit more on their theorizations and practice today, um, their turnout, turnout for Standing Rock and Ferguson um, was uh, came following a deep period of study, reflection, and practice of reciprocal solidarity with Native and Black communities prior to 2014 and 2016. Um, the other thing I want to just start off before I really delve into what it means to think Palestine through Standing Rock is the question of what it means for a new generation of Palestinian youth here who reside and live uh, on Turtle Island. This is a generation um, who are growing into political consciousness following the 1993 Oslo Accords, that period where, as uh, Roba, as you illustrated so beautifully in the abstract for this talk, the project of the nation state was um, not yet realized, but fully mutilated, right? That is a peace process that ultimately um, decimated a lot of Palestinian diasporic political and social space. Um, and that really created a new neck bear or a new severance for a new generation of Palestinians um, who did not inherit a lot of the political vehicles that our ancestors had created and utilized throughout history, but who were left with a, a military occupation and dispossession that continued. 
So for a new generation, um, the presence at Standing Rock and at Ferguson is in part a renewal and a, a rekindling of bonds with our own Palestinian political history. For Standing Rock in particular, to think Palestine through Standing Rock, it, it invokes a lot of other questions, um, sometimes more questions than answers. What does it mean to live on stolen land as people who are dispossessed, but who are fighting for a cause in which land sovereignty is central and, and is the central and persistent aspiration? How do we form and embody practice with our land if we are denied access to it? What responsibilities do we have to the indigenous people here, to the stewards of this place? What responsibilities do we have to their ongoing struggle of protracted resistance, cultural revitalization, refusal to disappear in accordance with settler designs? And how have we learned from our native siblings about the importance of knowledge and practice that regards land as a provider of life rather than a commodity within the settler colonial private property regime? This is a profoundly anti-capitalist ethos as many of our indigenous siblings, including those at Standing Rock have taught us. How might this indigenous theorizations and practices with land open up new possibilities for us as Palestinians living in exile to participate in Palestine as a global decolonial struggle as well. There are other things that uh, Standing Rock presents for us. Um, it rekindles our understanding of Samut. In Palestinian social and cultural traditions, we value the practice of Samut, the embodied practice of refusal, of vigilance, of stead the steadfast will to stay in place to withstand torture of interrogation practices, to maintain clarity of that for which we fight when material, material violence we experience rains down heavily. How does the Palestinian diaspora formulate practices of Samud in the context of dispossession? Well, members of the Palestinian Youth Movement delegation to Standing Rock learned in action, not just in theory, what it means to practice Samud, an embodied embodiment of both the richness of Palestinian radical tradition and that of the Ocheti resistance and all of indigenous people. Defending the sacred, what does it mean to defend the sacred? How does sacred space mobilize the emotional and spiritual worlds that are at the heart of political struggle? Um, you know, the Palestinian youth movement has been deeply involved in struggles across Turtle Island for the defense of sacred space, including the defense of um, Shell Mound in, um, on the Ohlone lands of the Bay Area. But what the 2021 uprisings reaffirmed for us as Palestinians is that Jerusalem or the defense of sacred space is still a huge component of mobilizing the emotional and spiritual worlds of indigenous people. Um, we continue to fight for the repatriation of our martyrs. We continue to fight against the building of the Holocaust Memorial Museum that's being built atop of one of the largest and oldest Palestinian cemeteries in Jerusalem. We continue to fight for dignity for the dead and for their um, and, and against the enduring violence that this causes for their living loved ones who are prohibited from being able to worship and, um, and pray for them in, in, in sacred space. Standing Rock also teaches us about the renewal of struggle. What does it mean to be involved in a renewal of struggle as a new generation? Um, I remember when our Palestinian Youth Movement delegation arrived in Standing Rock, they were introduced to some of the elders there who told them, you know, they were some of the, their comrades said, oh, uh, these are the Palestinians. And the elders looked at them and said, welcome home. You have been gone too long. Um, this is a space that invites Palestinians as guests rather than reminding us of our lasting impermanence, our otherness, or treating us as the subjects of suspicion in the broader war on terror context. These elders shared with the Palestinian youth stories about the United Nations Declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples construction and how Palestinians alongside American Indian communities came together to formulate the language for that, um, for that declaration. And Ferguson, there are also so many lessons that Palestinians have taken from Ferguson. Ferguson has reminded us or at, forced us to reckon with the question, what are the debts that we as Palestinians living in Turtle Island owe to black America? How do we understand the conditions of possibility for the formation of this nation based on racial chattel slavery and genocide? A recognition of the extraction of labor, of the constancy of denial of access to rights bearing citizenship and therefore entrance into what it means to be human. But also the lessons we have learned from the black radical tradition and collective survival 
in protracted struggle, in patience and tenacity, a reckoning that, that the ways in which we suffer as Palestinians are linked to the racialized technologies of captivity that have facil been facilitated th through anti-Blackness, but also that the privileges we hold, the ability to ascend towards right-bearing citizenship and its ties to whiteness are also hinged on a structure that denies access to Black communities and others. We learn from Ferguson about the importance of insurgent struggle. The body of Michael Brown lay in the streets of Ferguson exposed to the public for nearly four hours. Ferguson reminded us that freedom and justice will not be gifted to our communities, but must be taken. It was, if nothing more, a reminder that urgent, ur insurgent struggle is necessary because life is quite literally on the line. For a group like Palestinian Youth Movement, it was not difficult to draw linkages between the biopolitical racialized carceral regimes of, the U of US anti-Blackness and the state of Israel. The events in Ferguson coincided with the Israeli war on the Gaza Strip. Drawing linkages between the two was made more clear in this moment. But for some of us in the Palestinian Youth Movement, we knew that this was to be involved, we knew um, that this was a moment to be involved in simultaneous yet overlapping spaces. During the 2009 assault on the Gaza Strip, our Bay Area chapter had learned that lesson while actively participating in protest against the war on Gaza and against the BART police murder of Oscar Grant. The urgency of the moment taught us that crisis was mounting in different geographies of the world, intent to split us toward different directions, even internally split our emotional commitments, but that the multiplicity of catastrophes demands collectivity. Affect. Ferguson and Black struggle has taught us about affect. Palestinian youth, we've been denied access to our own histories, to our land, to our communities. So oftentimes we learned about the radical works of Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde and Angela Davis before we even knew about the Palestinian thinkers and, and uh, political movers and shakers of the past. We learned about the social wellness programs of the Black Panther Party, seeing how politics of care have translated into radical Black movements at Ferguson and beyond, and the discipline and responsibility to the people that accompanies organized militancy has assisted the Palestinian youth movement establish an affective ethos, a core value of care that centers the work around not just surviving, but thriving. The formation of PYM's service to the people paradigms, the opening of a refugee support center in San Diego, the offering of emergency services to refugees from across the Asian and African continent in Greece, the mutual aid fundraisers we organized for refugees in the camp of Lebanon, Lebanon and for the communities here during the pandemic, the creation of best practices to keep our protest and movement spaces free of violence, harm, and injury. These are things that have been inspired by the Black revolutionary tradition and the service to the people programs which it offered, but it also opened the margins for us to study how and why these same mutual aid and care and affective program have always been part of the Palestinian revolutionary tradition as well. I'll stop there for, for now. Thank you, Lubna, for these fantastic reflections and uh, really deep um, accounts of also of the work of the precious work of the Palestinian youth movement over the last few years. I just don't want to take too much time and uh, move on to uh, give the floor to Miriam. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation, uh, Ruba, and, uh, and for doing all of this in this very tough, busy term time. And uh, as uh, uh, the British uh, colleagues know, we are at the moment uh, going through another two weeks of uh, national strikes, uh, the uh, UCU, Union of Higher Education. So all support is welcome. Um, and uh, hopefully it will also allow us to create the space to discuss these very topics because the British uh, context is also one whereby most universities or a lot of universities, uh, not most, uh, have adopted the IHRA definition on anti-Semitism, which has also made it very problematic to stop uh, to, to talk about these very topics uh, and has created a certain tendency of self-censorship. So I just wanted to uh, put that out there. The other thing I wanted to put out there is congratulations, Mesa. Uh, the victory is Im immense. Uh, I'm just moved to tears. And I, I think it's so, so important that you've managed to do that in the US. 
uh, because we uh, take inspiration and energy from each other, right? So I, I think like Brismas here in Britain and other groups will take inspiration from Mesa. I mean, the, the results are incredible. I think 80% voted uh, for uh, the boycott. I mean, it's just really great. So thank you so much. Uh, but it's not unrelated to what I wanted to say because the topic of today, uh, kinship, radical kinship, intersectionality, um, they are part of, of, of this idea, right? Of how we identify with the struggles across nations and across uh, communities, but also how we identify and take and borrow and learn from each other's tactics and strategies, right? Um, and I wanted to pick up on this discussion also in relation to discussions I've engaged with over the past uh, four or five years and actually build on some of the things I've written about this uh, in race and class on the topic on white privilege, how privilege has become or whiteness has also become a shortcut politics in, in anti-racism, but also discussions uh, that I had and some things I've written about radical kinship uh, and also a new piece that is coming out with Leia Ftuni, the great comrade who is uh, editing a really beautiful special issue on dark matter on, on, these, on these questions. And I've had these discussions because I myself became part personally of you know, this kind of entanglement between the contradictions of solidarity, where on the one hand, uh, the self-evidence with which a lot of us uh, uh, work around um, citations, quotes, uh, symbols, uh, logos from different struggles, and then the contradiction of what in a world in which a lot of debates about uh, political struggles and their concepts like uh, intersectionality or decolonization or solidarity have actually been co-opted uh, by an academic uh, discourse that has changed also the meaning of these concepts and this and thus create situations in which, for instance, activist groups who uh, quote or who use symbols or examples from one another will have to answer for appropriation or where you have discussions whereby, for instance, um, uh, I think that particularly the exports, some things I think you should keep to the, to the limits of the US, please don't export them, <laughs> but the export of Afro-pessimism also in the European anti-racism movement has also created rifts between uh, groups that have been conceptualized as NBPOC, non-Black people of color, and BPOC, Black people of color. And I think these have created really sometimes tough, difficult, painful, but necessary discussions, because it also means we are moving forward in a different reality that requires us to also just go through these discussions. Of course, the conditions of going through these discussions is that you can agree to disagree and that they are comradely discussions. So I'm, I'm, I've been doing that and I'm, I'm still building uh, on that. And I'm thinking of how to, how to relate all of these debates whilst doing politics, right? So not as divorce from doing politics. I think this is really important. <laughs> I mean, we can analyze and publish and have nice peer reviewed articles, but the question also is how do we do this while we are, are, are engaging in the movements as well? So I incorporate a framework of the struggle against racism and oppression that I found best described by Ato Sekiu Utu uh, as left universalism. So of course, the idea of justice and equality and universal principles that many have discussed and in the writings of, of uh, that already mentioned, uh, um, uh, Ruba already mentioned Angela Davis about, about the relation between Palestine and, and black lives, of course, is very much about his universalism, but specifically his notion of left universalism in order to distinguish that from this European notion of universalism that is allied also to uh, civilization. But it is a, a left universalism that is grounded in the conception of uh, humanity, but a humanity that wants to, not only can or is able to, but wants to transcend the privatized individual seeking freedom. So there's a difference between is able to and want to, right? And many are able to, but don't want to, right? So this is kind of like the, the liberal position. So it's about how to think together about how we can both discover and recover 
some of these uh, progressive principles, because as Ruba and uh, Lubna already uh, uh, explained so well, these are part and parcel of uh, 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 these principles have been produced through practices in, in, the, in, the, in the past. They are past, part of our history. They are part of the history of uh, um, internationalism, of uh, feminism from the global south, of all these, all these experiences in, in, in the past have produced these principles. So we are recovering those that have been invisibilized, but in the process, discovering new ones. So for me, this is uh, an ambiguous discussion because I'm now having this discussion in an academic space. So I'm saying all of this, which is really easy to say, but I'm saying this in an academic seminar, right? So it's quite, it's an ambiguous, uh, I think, intention. And, and I feel this is important to put it out there because in the writings I am experimenting with on radical kinship, I frame the, the risks of, engaging with these questions only in academic spaces as uh, resulting from the problem of what I call <laughs> academic cannibalism. There is a, a, a process, a dynamic, that when concepts are inhabited in academic spaces, they actually lose their some of their meanings, they become something else. It's like the academic cannibalism uh, uh, factory, it takes all kinds of progressive concepts, it eats them, it digests them, and it spits out something else. It sounds the same, but it's something very different. So what happens when certain concepts then slip into, for instance, dogma, where the idea of uh, uh, critical concepts from intersectionality that have to do with creative citation of women of color, where what happens when that then becomes a dogma of appropriation? You know, like, and that means you can't appropriate someone else's uh, struggle or work because they are not part of your particular ethnic or whatever history. So you see that how in campus spaces, in academic spaces, these the critical necessary interventions of, for instance, black feminism or other feminism become something uh, else. And at which point also do tactics, necessary tactics, but at which point do necessary tactics start to over take strategy. So the tactic of acknowledging difference, the tactic of acknowledging our vulnerabilities, when does it actually begin to overtake the strategy of unity? Because it's a mathematical question, right? Like we have to be united because we will otherwise never win. That's just mathematics, right? So when do some tactics overtake strategies? So this is more than a theoretical question for me because the ideologies of capitalism they can adapt uh, to anything and they can survive and, 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 and adapt to anything. And so that's why in our universities, notions like inclusion, identity, diversity, they have become really part of the prize tenets of what we can call the marketplace of ideas. So a political affinity in my view is actually one that is blessed with uh, what I call, I don't know if this makes any sense, you should give me feedback, uh, but uh, I try to converse across languages, but I call it uh, baraka uh, in the Moroccan culture, but also in other, I think, Arab cultures, uh, the idea of, of, of the endowment of, of baraka. So I call it the baraka of radical kinship is what gives us the strength to not fall into these uh, traps, but also to win. And this baraka of radical kinship so this baraka is, the, is what I condition radical kinship with, because I don't want radical kinship just to be an empty term that we can throw around like we do decolonization and intersectionality. It is conditioned by this baraka that I uh, identify as universalism and internationalism. Those are the viewpoints, the horizons that are part of what uh, define this uh, radical kinship. And so the legacies of these viewpoints, there are so many of them. I mean, just uh, the abstract of this panel has, has given you lots of uh, beautiful uh, examples, but the intergenerational condition of our movement are actually, or let's say the absent of the intergenerational uh, characteristics of our movement are often not sufficient to transcend our own contemporariness, to transcend our own temporal idea of the present and tap into those legacies in a healthy way. And I mean this, for instance, by the way we condition sometimes our movement, actually it doesn't give the space to have 
elderly people as part and parcel of the movement beyond just the advisor that you some, sometimes go to. No, but the elderly as part of the movement that we are constructing. Uh, so there's a certain age uh, uh, frame in, in, in our contemporary movements, right? So I think that uh, this radical kinship and the, and, the, and the baraka of it that is intergenerational through an internationalist and universalist way is a way to find a solution. So I'm trying to also be productive here. Like how get, do we get out of the conditionalities of our movements that create these tensions and problems and invisibilities? Well, I think this is one of the uh, um, uh, solutions. And I think everyday life provides us with plenty of examples, right? I mean, just look at our language uh, across different languages. Uh, uh, we will have um, connotations that allude to a variety of intimations and kinships, such as an akh or an ukht, rafiq or rafiqa. We have khay or khuya, depending where you are in the in the in the region. Uh, we have uh, beautiful expressions like sister from another mister, brother from another mother, or in Britain, fam. So there's already in our everyday life this kinship that is so much more broader than uh, we think of, besides the point that, of course, this has been uh, theorized and analyzed by plenty of anthropologists, as Ruba uh, uh, probably also knows. Like kinship studies has really been part of the history of uh, anthropological uh, theory, right? But one thing that the, the, the historical uh, um, uh, anthropological theorization of, of, of uh, kinship has given us is the understanding that individuals and members of groups uh, in any given society, any given society, this is a, this is a universal uh, phenomenon, uh, can experience different degrees of relationship. This is uh, a fact. So it is, in other words, a choice. We all have a choice to extend our uh, uh, kinship, to, in, in, to encompass a radical kinship. So my idea of a radical kinship is framed through these conditions and operate through particular acts of camaraderie. That's why I'm saying the space of academia is not per se the best space, although they could be good spaces to come together and discuss critically. But the act of camaraderie is, I think, what uh, maintains you. So stretching the idea of kinship with uh, uh, um, humanity or uh, or as we see with notions of the ummah, for instance, or class, class is one of those stretches of kinship, right? As working class uh, peoples, uh, the oppressed is also uh, a stretching uh, of kinship has been uh, re really powerful in our history of social movement. So the question of what does it mean to think through, like, like uh, the title of this meeting and Ruba's question, what is it to think through Palestine, or you can reverse it, think Palestine through uh, Standing Rock, or think Palestine through Ukraine, or think Palestine through the Amazigh uprisings in Morocco, right? Well, it me this means, in my opinion, it means thinking through kinship as a form of activist affinity. That's what it means. When you let go of the idea of affinity and kinship, uh, of as, as also Ruba said, as being confined by in a nationalist frame, or that means for me, on a sort of discursive level, thinking Palestine through uh, something else. So this is related again, as I said, to the political horizons. And I wanted to end uh, this uh, example or this, uh, um, uh, you know, attempt to um, to promote uh, the idea of radical kinship uh, through the through through the. Uh, um, to sharing with you when I first, the first time I heard it. So the first time I heard about such a notion was in the summer of 2015 in uh, Palestine. Um, and I sat in, in Ramallah in this case, I was almost dumbfounded. Uh, I was there, my friend and comrade Omar Jabari Salamanca organized the conference, brilliant conference. And I was sat there and I was listening to a paper by someone. I was feeling a mix of serendipity and listening uh, with joy and, and, as I said, astonishment to African-American professor of literature, Greg Thomas. He narrated a story about the exhibit George Jackson in the Sun of Palestine. The African-American revolutionary Black Panther uh, writer uh, and poet Jackson, George Jackson, was killed in 1971 in St. Quentin prison by prison guards. 
So he explained that then a magical mistake happened. A magical mistake happened about the authorship of a particular poem. And he explained the authorship was born from the radical kinship between Palestinian and Black American prisoners experiences. And so before it was discovered that the poem that was accidentally identified as a poem of George Jackson, before it was discovered that Jackson had taken the poem actually from an anthology of Palestinian poets published by Black radical printer Drum and Spear Press, the handwritten poem Enemy of the Sun by Samir al Qasim that was found in the cell of George uh, uh, Jackson because he had handwritten taken it over from a magazine in, in which it was uh, published, created this uh, this this uh, you know moment as uh, of magic as uh, as uh, Greg Thomas uh, called it. The confusion over the source of the poems continues until today, actually. I mean, it's still circulated under the name of George Jackson in many uh, publications, but the tenet of Thomas' argument was how much the poem spoke of the same world of oppression and resistance. It was a very easy mistake to make because it spoke of the same world of, uh, of oppression. So Thomas emphasized how these movements were deeply committed in their solidarity with and to each other. And this mistake is what we can call poetic justice. This example reflects the implications of closeness in the expression of brotherhood, as I said uh, before, this paradigm shifting that radical kinship uh, offers. That exchange is explicitly not about genetic or cultural resemblance. And it's a familiar feature in this framework that we can find with the idea of reciprocity. We give, we take. And not as a condition, we only give if we take, we only take if we give. This reciprocity was almost a coincidence. So I love this example of this uh, kind of magic uh, uh, mistake, also because it is a kinship that is not in terms of material valuations and not about calculations. It is a relationality that is joined through benevolence from those whose acts we derive our energy from. And that energy is what we need to source those very political horizons. Imagine we were living in a world where people of Palestinian descent would have said, you are a culturally appropriating Palestinian history and it does not belong to uh, the Black Panther Party. No, the political horizon of that time was like, we are honored that you had made this mistake. It is an honor for us that you thought our poem uh, was yours. So I wanted to end there as, as the example where for me, radical kinship became a thing to uh, try to achieve. Thank you, Miriam. This is wonderful. And again, <clears throat> there is so much that we need to grapple with and so many insights and so many uh, intertwined histories and uh, flow of, of ideas that starting from, as you both mentioned, the internationalism of the 50s and 60s onwards. I would like just to go back to the question, sort of the framing a little bit and, and see whether we can focus a little bit or linger over um, the possibility that um, we also borrow from indigenous and uh, black scholarship, uh, that intertwining or um, bringing a late race lens into Palestinian studies, what does it bring uh, with itself and whether it is a, a possibility that opens up novel ways of understanding um, the Palestinian question. And here I'd like to, first of all, go back to the question of sort of the, the very now, by now sort of um, maybe too much cannibalized to use Miriam's notion, uh, idea of decoloniality, which I still think needs to be reappropriated if anything by activists and uh, maybe de decoupled from its um, too often um, capitalistic branding that uh, a lot of our institutions <laughs> um, work through and, um, and think about sort of the ways in which um, another type of borrowing, the borrowing of scholars like, of colonial scholars like Yano who have um, thought of decoloniality in terms of um, 
special articulation of power that has been constitutive of modernity since at least the 16th century Atlantic trade. And in which framework um, the temporal differentiation between colonial and post-colonial conditions is very much problematized. Um, since colonialism is not just a derivative historical moment of modernity, which ended with independence. And in, for us, this is really important to kind of grapple with. Of course, modernity continues to be and will continue to be after liberation in a nation state setting or in a liberal nation state setting. It continued to be uh, about the production of colonial differences. In other words, modernity unfolded as a planetary racial capitalist system creating the epistemic and structural conditions for the exploitation and control of black, brown bodies and of their land, of their resources and of their labor. And I think that this is another way in which I think um, our ways of rethinking Palestine has benefited a lot from um, interweaving our framings with the framings of um, scholarship that emerged elsewhere. And in the context, I think, on, of Palestine, I think it's, it's becoming very interesting to see how there is a burgeoning body of work that, um, that has featured or has foregrounded race uh, or that has shown how racial hierarchies among Jews and Arabs were foundational to the formation, for example, of 20th century um, social hierarchies in Israel-Palestine. Uh, think of the work, for example, of on laboring bodies of Ben Ziv, or most crucially, the work of Lana Tatur on citizenship and settler colonialism, among others. And here I would like to, um, to just um, spend a couple of minutes um, uh, focusing on this relationship between citizenship and, and settler colonialism as it has unfolded in the context of, um, of Palestine. Um, Lana's work, which looks at the formation of citizenship in settler colonial contexts, including in Israel, has allowed us to put under this deep scrutiny um, the ideal of equality afforded by the myth of the nation state and of liberal citizenship within it. As Lana herself has argued, um, by referring to the logic of profit and dispossession and at Standing Rock and other settler colonial contexts, and I quote her, while overlapping at times, domination and exclusion are not the same. Exclusion is one form of domination and inclusion does not necessarily mean the end of domination. Um, so looking for example at how sort of the US, Australia and, and other contexts have, um, where citizenship has been um, utilized to normalize domination, to naturalize such a sovereignty and, um, and in which um, this has happened by, you know, by the tool that citizenship um, lends itself to of classifying populations, producing differences, creating new novel categories of inclusion, exclusion, et cetera, et cetera. I think we, um, we begin to see sort of the similarities between contexts such as Canada, Australia, and the denativization or de-indigenization of this context uh, with the context of Israel. Um, another point that I wanted to make, uh, hoping that it will trigger more, more conversation, I mean, not that we don't have enough to think about, but <laughs> um, I thought is um, actually stemming from um, a very beautiful, I mean, going back to the question of land and how to reconceptualize land beyond uh, what could be seen as a logic of dispossession and repossession uh, stemming from a liberal framework. You know, how do we, how do we conceive of um, reappropriation beyond repossession, right? Which I think for me is a, is a very crucial question. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm inspired by some of the work of the PYM here and um, particularly um, those young people who have uh, been a living embodiment of these processes of kinship that Miriam so eloquently spoke about uh, at these sites of struggle, such as Standing Rock and, and, and other places, and that Lubna has um, so beautifully described earlier. Um, so I remember like one of your members of the PYM in, in, in the US chapter, Lubna was talking about land uh, and expressing how for her, part of freeing the land was about getting to know, to know it, healing the relationship to land being in relationship and reciprocity to land. 
and expressing how this is what makes us different from colonizers and, com and capitalists. Land is not property, is not an object. Land is life, land is alive, land is lineage, land is home, land is ancestors and origins. So that means we have a responsibility to tending as it tends us. Decolonizing our land and ourselves mean really healing these relationships. So this is my contribution to that kind of decolonization, remembering our traditional ways of healing, of being, of thinking, and of living. And I remember reading this um, long quote from one of the, the, the sort of the activists and, and, um, and feeling how much <laughs> Um, the reason this in terms of um, really making visible the, the legacies of these different um, types of mobilizations stemming from and across such a colonial context and strategies of resistance, which I think have really fertilized our way of thinking about land. Not that we needed, like I think indigeneity was there uh, and is there in our, in the legacies of our elderly. And, uh, but I think that it needed to be re, uh, up, it needed to be, for um, centered in our ways of, of, um, of articulating our project of liberation. Um, and um, going back to the question of um, uh, one other point I wanted to make is uh, the point that I think is really crucial here, again, going back to the issue of visibility and, um, and what I call in an article I co-authored with uh, Lynn Welshman and Elena Zambelli, the intersectional space of appearance. And I, I, I wanted to uh, interject both Lugna and Miriam's issues around kinship and visibility and, and recipro reciprocity by really um, reiterating the importance of um, visibility of the politics of presence across these sites of struggle. Um, I think we are witnessing a, <clears throat> um, we are witnessing a, a novel transnational praxis and modalities of resistance, which is really premised on a physical and visual presence of Palestine, which is premised on um, th thick and sustained uh, numbers of travels across sites of struggle, uh, standing rock, refugee camps, as Lugna very eloquently described, border zones, Mexico and US borders, um, um, participation, uh, whether physical or not, to the Arab Springs um, 10 years ago, and these are practices that sustained and they were sustained through relationship of friendship, of trust among activists. Again, going back to the issue that uh, Miriam was, was raising. Um, and I want to emphasize this because I think that in the context in, in which we are increasingly surveilled and, uh, and uh, detected, uh, the issue of friendship, of love even, of care, of, of caring for one another becomes even more um, crucial. Uh, the question of trust, the question of who you trust uh, in, in activism and across these sites of struggle and, and the amount of relationships of trust and friendship that were created, I think, across these different places is, 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 is incredible. Um, I, um, I think that um, this is one line that also allows us to, um, to, again, stress the importance of appearance, of appearing to one another, as, as, we, as we know, sort of, one of the central, uh, at least in, in, in Western liberal thought, idea of, of political agency arises from Hannah Arendt's notion of the space of appearance, which is a space where, um, you know, one is a space of, of, um, of speech and action whereby diverse and plural people appear to one another uh, in order to, to create the, the space of politics. But what is really interesting here is that these spaces of appearance are cross-cut cross -cut intersectionally. They, they also show that these, um, these are not just um, spaces of speech and action, they are effective multi-sided political spaces which make visible the continuum of systems of subjugation and expropriation across liberal democracies and settler colonial regimes. And they are also, and first and foremost, embodied spaces, spaces of, of, of embodied performances um, where these racialized degrees of grievability and precariousness become visible to one another, and which allow, I think, the formation of political alliances that are novel, that are intersectional, um, across 
movements that, whose grievances are similarly rooted in the structural violence of Western colonial modernity. So we are reminded to conclude and again pass the floor on to you, um, specifically again of Angela Davis' focus on making visible the intersectionality of struggles. So that, and I quote, when we see the police repressing protests in Ferguson, we, we, have, we also have to think about the Israeli police and the Israeli army repressing protests in occupied Palestine. So again, the importance of this embodied performative um, space of appearance that constitutes, uh, I think, a, no a very novel form of thinking about inter intersectional uh, praxis across settler colonial and um, uh, liberal democratic contexts. Um, I would like to um, uh, give the floor back to you. Uh, maybe this time, uh, Miriam, do you want to, or maybe Lubna, since you've been silent for a while now, you would like to, uh, I would really love to hear your uh, thoughts about this. Yeah, um, thank you so much, Rabbi. You've given us so much to think about. And, you know, I, I have to say that one of the things that, you know, we, we've been discussing is like, as much as there has been a growth of coalitional collective work between communities that bridge um, bridge causes and geographies and issues together, there also has been a resurgence of kind of nihilistic, um, fatalistic, na overly nationalist, ethnocentric tendencies in a lot of our movements. And I think that um, for me, you know, I might have political and intellectual differences with, uh, you know, a lot of the different ideologies or, or um, kind of tendencies that are growing in, in, in organizing spaces today. But I do try to take a step back to understand where they come from. And I think of um, a lot of these tendencies coming from exactly as you described, Roba, earlier, the um, the broken promises, the false solutions, the neoliberal remedies to structural problems that we've seen, not just on Turtle Island, but in Palestine, whether that's the Oslo Accords in Palestine or the passage of civil rights here, or you know, the end of de jure apartheid in South Africa. You know, we, we celebrated these milestones um, as moments of freedom, moments that would realize the aspirations that social movements had long fought for. And in turn, you know, the colonial state um, kind of reorganized um, its processes of racialized subjugation, gendered and sexual violence, disposability, dispossession. I think that part of, um, part of the struggles that our communities have is this sense of um, impatience, this sense of deep frustration with um, where we are in the current moment, you know? Um, and I think that part of, part of um, Part of the issue is that every community is hurting so deeply that sometimes we fall into a very capitalist or settler colonial understanding of scarcity, right? That there's a scarcity of space for my community, that there's a scarcity of um, ability to recognize and empathize with our pain, a scarcity of recognition or acknowledgement of our historic suffering. So I mention all this because, um, you know, Roba, as you're saying, like when we see, um, you know, attack on black life in the US, what, when will we be at a point where we can immediately understand and, and where it can immediately signal also the struggle of Palestinian people or the attack on Palestinian life. And I think that part of the reason why there's so much hesitancy to go there or vice versa uh, for any of our communities is because um, this, because of, because of how much um, violence each community has had when we fall into the in, into into frameworks of scarcity, um, so the reason I mention all this is because you know when we go back to the questions of land and decolonization or questions of of um, you know um, the future, right, the future of intersectional struggle, one of the things that I I think um, is really valuable is to think about what are the actual pedagogically engaged practices between social movements where the philosophies that we might hold for our own communities are also things that we can work to apply to other communities. And I'll give you, I'll give you an example of this. So 
um, in the Palestinian youth movement, you know, it has a very clear politics on Zionism. It believes in liberation of all the land and all the people of Palestine, the right of return to Palestine, and Zionism uh, as a settler colonial um, ideology and project, the abolition of Zionism as a settler colonial and ideological pro project. But when the Palestinian youth movement was proposed with um, whether or not they adopt an abolitionist vision here in the United States regarding the prison industrial complex, racial carcerality and policing, there was like a, there was like a question, right? Like what is abolition? What would it look like, right? Um, and, and it wasn't an immediate adoption of abolition. It was something that needed to be engaged. I think that throughout, throughout the movement for black lives in the last few years, particularly following the murder of uh, George Floyd and, and Breonna Taylor, um, you know, the Palestinian youth movement has learned a lot about um, both the black radical traditions, like century, centuries long struggle for abolition, and also how it actually very much aligns with the Palestinian youth movement's vision on Zionism and, and a decolonized future for the land and people of Palestine for the future. And so when you, when there's a deep reflection on that alignment, which by the way, happens a lot in academia. We can easily in academia talk about intersectional struggle and abolition of all these borders and all these violent systems all across the world. But where things kind of get tricky is when you need to talk about the pragmatic implementation of those lofty, utopic, really liberatory visions. And so I think in the Palestinian youth movement, there's been a, a recognition that abolitionist vision or decolonized futures also needs to be accompanied by a responsibility on to act, right? And it's not just go out there and act, it's how do you act? How do you act in a way that doesn't continue reproducing ethnocentrism or nationalism or reproducing contradictions in what you say versus how you actually show up? Um, and, and, though, and that's the moment where things get really tough. That's the moment where politics can concede and the intersectional visions that we're talking about sometimes don't actually get translated into practice. I think that groups like the PYM are really trying to work through that. And I think last year in the 2021 uprisings was a really good example of that because as the PYM was organizing um, rallies across Turtle Island, you know, um, like daily rallies across Turtle Island for almost a month, we were met with a lot of challenges regarding the question of um, talking to our communities and refusing to apply for police permits. You know, we, we didn't want to apply for police permits. We didn't want to cross the picket line that our Black siblings have set up for us around abolition. But the tensions that are aff affiliated with that, with that um, radical act means that there's a lot of conversation, a lot of education that needs to happen in our own communities, and a lot of work that needs to be accompanied to how do you keep the protest space safe from police violence who are going to come out when you don't have a police permit, right? Um, so I think that these are these are just some of my thoughts on um, on on intersectional struggle on um, and, and on um, the the ticky, the stickiness and then the tensions and contradictions that some come sometimes come up when we when we extend them beyond the thought process and into the the action process. The only other last thing that I would I would say regarding so much of the brilliant insights that you offered, Droba, is about the question of decolonization being so central to um, the future of the world that we're trying to create, not just the present world that we're trying to destroy, right, through that abolitionist practice. That's also what abolitionist thinkers and movement practitioners have taught us all, you know, all throughout time. And maybe it's taken a long time for people to understand it. Maybe people still don't completely understand it, but it's about producing the vision and the practice of the world that we want to live in. And I, I really appreciate the Palestinian feminist collective space that I'm in, because I think that that practice is being engaged there more than any other organizing space I've ever been in. Brilliant, thank you so much, uh, Lubna. Um, over to Miriam. Okay, on mute. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. That was a lot. Uh, I tried to organize some of my thoughts because there were very different um, topics. Uh, but so I do apologize if it uh, comes across a bit uh, confusing. But I think they're kind of tied also to what um, some of the things Lubna just said that I thought was really interesting and thought provoking about, for instance, um, what you said about scarcity. I think this is uh, the um, 
the uh, one area where you can see uh, very, very clear similarities between the dynamics in academia and in activism, uh, where the uh, a notion of a public sphere, public intellectual political sphere that used to be associated with like intellectual work in academia or activism has also become partly incorporated into all these different algorithmic things like impact and in Britain we have ref and now we have CAF and I don't know what else we're going to be getting soon <laughs> as ways to sort of you know almost uh, materially uh, assess what we're doing and I think that it's really interesting also to see for instance in the past years the tension uh, arising particularly in areas in avenues where you see both the kind of uh, attempt to build uh, alternative spaces or do anti-racist politics and uh, uh, the amb ambition or let's say the the the, um, the necessity because often it's necessity to apply for funding so when you see both things coming together that's when also when you see the notion of scarcity becoming a kind of political tool through which divide and rule can be operated very easily. And this has been, of course, done uh, and, and dusted and perfected in the 70s and 80s, because that relates to what you said also, uh, Lubna, about some of these discussions and tensions also have to do with um, uh, projections almost of uh, a sense of defeat, of moments of loss, of where movements have been betrayed uh, or lost, whether it's Oslo or towards the end of the 70s and in early 80s, uh, the social movement in the US, which then moved into academic spaces, right? That's my whole point about like why, you know, when privilege, uh, white privilege or white supremacy is not anymore just a discussion for activists, but a whole discipline has been built on that, on whiteness studies, etc. It's actually also because it emerged at the time, this discipline, uh, where people have been coming together that were part of movements. They, they, their movements lost and they went into academia and they did, they continued their public intellectual work, but as academics. Uh, so well-meaning things like from the nap, nap jack, uh, what is it called, knapsack thingy about white privilege to other ideas about also intersectionality, some of them really well-meaning, but uh, outside the scope of the, uh, the the communities and collectives that used to naturally and is again but that used to naturally have that kind of check and balance function you know when you are embedded within the community you will be held accountable so what is this uh, what does this mean for us or, or what do you mean? We don't understand that complex sentence you just told us. <laughs> you academics, what do you mean? So this, this kind of check and balance also. So the divorcing from that also gradually uh, led to these uh, uh, dynamics whereby you know uh, scarcity also becomes a push and pull factor. And for me, that was really interesting when you said that because it reminded me of how for instance, in Europe, uh, and I think also the European Union, but also the United Nations definition uh, that came out of uh, the um, it's the the, senior, uh, the, uh, the decade, decade of Africa, it uh, came with very problematic definitions of what Africa is. And so what you saw was that when you define, for instance, Africa as in, 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 to put it really simply, through phenotype racial characteristics, where you connect Africa to the notion of black and you, you reiterate, reiterate this very racist European notion of a sub-Saharan Africa and a North Saharan Africa, which is a racist European notion that came out of this, you know, uh, idea of the useful, the useless, uh, the, the civilized, the uncivilized, right? What you get is groups and communities that are applying for funding of that UN program or EU program 
discover that although they thought they were African, they are not African. So what you got was groups competing over these resources that are scarce based on new definitions uh, that uh, completely change their, their identity or what they're supposed to be. To put it really frank, what you got was some weird stuff whereby North Africans, Moroccans, Algerians that belong to the most subjugated racialized minorities in Europe, B, go be a Maghreb in France and tell me what privilege you have being non-black brown. You know, be a Moroccan in Holland where your uh, name is the number one uh, um, swear word, Kut Moroccan. Kant Moroccan. It's the number one swear word. It surpassed, to tell you something about the civilized Dutch, it surpassed the other swear word, Jew. Yeah. So the whole idea of NBPOC, POC, and this whole export of Afro pessimism getting like mingled into this idea of what Africa is and that it's about, this gets manifested in very concrete way when we look at it through a material lens of scarcity, where you see groups competing over basically crumbs, of crumbs of uh, funding, but that need to be understood, as you said, not as cultural or uh, uh, typical uh, feelings towards each other, but of feelings and intentions that need to be analyzed to where they emerge. How did it emerge? Like you said, it emerged from moments of for instance, defeat, moments of crackdown, well, it emerged from moments of redefinitions through funding regime. So I think just to respond also to you, Alubna, so that we have also a conversation, this is, uh, this, this for me is very concrete because it shows that any analysis should have a material component. So we need to, in our analysis, uh, I mean, there's this saying, uh, what was it? Um, raise the money or something, follow the money. There's this expression, follow the money. Well, actually, in a lot of like social movement uh, changes and debates, it's not bad to follow the money. Follow where funding comes from and how it's defined. Follow how, for instance, um, uh, status and promotions are defined in universities. This idea of having had a, a leading role in EDI that can now make you also a professor, like follow that material trace. I think that's that's uh, really interesting. And that brings, of course, the question, I don't know if that is relevant to you, uh, uh, Ruba, but it brings in the uh, question yeah. of uh, class. You haven't mentioned that, but I think you need. we need to bring it back to the question of class, because yeah. not all Black Lives Matter is the same. Ferguson was very yeah. working class, and a Palestinian was actually yeah. uh, killed in, in Ferguson, right? Not uh, So I think class, maybe we can. Yeah, no, I think, um, I mean, I would like just to bring a concluding remark be before we move on to the, um, you know, we give an opportunity to the audience to ask questions, et cetera, because I think the last kind of, uh, uh, theme that I wanted to bring to the table was precisely to, to shift a bit the focus from North America and bring it to Europe. And you, Miriam, offered this on uh, really interesting, in a very interesting way, because again, following the route of the Palestinian youth movement uh, with whom we have interacted at great length in the past, um, it was very clear how, for example, from within the context of diasporic subjectivities of Palestinians living, for example, in France, um, they were inscribed, these young Palestinians inscribed in the post-colonial racialized figure of the Burr, which is the term defining second and third generation Arabs and the children and grandchildren of, of the former colonies. So it's very difficult. I mean, this is yet another type of intersection or transnational type of solidarity and, and affiliation and identification that is very much shaping the, the political subjectivities of, of the younger generations in Europe. And, but what is really interesting is that a lot of this, uh, um, differently from what we might assume, a lot of these young people are born and raised in very working class neighborhoods, the banlieues, and they face the same type of discrimination, exact same type um, as, black and as, as black and brown bodies in, in, in contemporary post-colonial France. And, and who were defining like the idea of being an Arab uh, until at least the Arab scream, scream uh, erupted in terms of or the being a young Arab in France as an impossibility, 
as a space of frustration and despair. And again, going back to the issue of, um, of appearance, uh, it, it, it was the spectacle, the spectacle of the young Arab women and men during the Arab Springs that propelled a novel sense of, or a novel possibility of existing for these young uh, Palestinian diasporic and um, Arab Burr subjects in France, for example, which however, so after a, a moment of really heightened enthusiasm, which really gave a sort of um, a platform and a voice and, and a sense of self realization, which lasted for some time, um, we are now back to a space of um, very heightened surveillance, very heightened censorship, very, uh, to, again, to that space of impossibility, which I think we all feel very strongly about. And, um, um, and I wanted to conclude by asking maybe, well, not asking because we don't have time to continue the conversation today, but I think by sort of um, maybe posing the question of how do we take it from there, so to speak. And um, yeah, Nadia, back to you. Yeah, well, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, clearly so much to discuss. And um, But I'm conscious that we have now several questions from the audience. So I would like to give at least a few people a chance. Um, so the first question, I'm going to um, read out two questions and then um, maybe any of you can just respond briefly uh, to one of the two questions. So the first one is by Marina Sanes, who's thanking you and saying, in many indigenous communities throughout Turtle Island, kinship is also directly tied to family clans and clan responsibilities. In my family, this was lost through detribalization, but this tradition continues in other ways, especially when children are born or during certain harvests. I'm curious to hear if there is a similar clan system or clan responsibilities in Palestine and how it might relate to radical kinship for non-Palestinians wanting to be in good relations with Palestinians. The second question is by Maris Kileda. Hello, Maris. I was also thanking you. Um, and especially for addressing the uncomfortable questions we face as beneficiaries of the academic spaces we critique. I want to probe a bit more into the inner dynamics of radical kinship, particularly how we can maintain an inner self critique amidst the fight against colonialism, racial capitalism, etc. Because in many instances, both historically and contemporary, Movements can be all the same, racist, patriarchal, classist, etc. Just thinking of the Egyptian left, for example. The question is not just about intellectual or moral critique necessarily, but about practices and mechanics that are attuned to these possibilities of inner injustices that mostly become secondary to the big fights. Another question to Miriam, can you please speak more about the issue of tactics overtaking strategy. Okay, so who'd like to start? Uh, Miriam, would you like to start? Yeah, sure, if that's okay with the lady. Uh, I leave the other question for uh, Lubna. I think uh, it's a very important uh, question about kinship in Palestinians or non-Palestinians wanting to be part of uh, uh, in good relations with Palestinians. So, I mean, I think the question of strategy and tactics is, is uh, relevant in that, uh, so uh, to, keep, um, to keep your eye on the prize, like when, I, I remember Angela Davis came to Amsterdam a few years ago amidst the whole debate and fights and whatever, and she was like, what's going on here? Uh, our uh, program, our ambition, our horizon uh, back in the days, because what, what was happening was that a lot of the symbolism of black power was very present. So the vernacular, the aesthetics of uh, resistance is very present, but the, the ideas, the basic principles behind it get a bit lost. So, so she said, our main goal was freedom, freedom, that was the goal. Black liberation is part of that. It's a big part of that. Uh, identity recognition is part of that. Uh, 
uh, politics around uh, names, uh, politics around uh, like uh, what you wear and your hair do. They are all part of that, but the point was freedom. And so to put it simply, the strategy of freedom uh, for from a progressive point of view is one that includes freedom for everybody. That there is that it, freedom in the progressive sense is not about my freedom. It's about uh, 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 one for all, all for one. And so what happens sometimes in movement is that the tactics that belong to that, sometimes the tactic is we want to organize separately just for a bit, yeah? We have our issues and we want to have a safe space. That's a tactic that could be a necessary temporary tactic. Then that overtakes at some point the strategy by becoming the goal. We have to be separate. We will uh, have our own picket line. We will have our own march. Uh, there can be no uh, other people than uh, 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 whatever, self-identified uh, 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 women of a particular. You see, that's the difference where tactics then overcome strategy. I think that's an example where you then lose sight of what was actually Thanks. the point. Great. Thank you very much. Lubna? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I love to talk about the question about uh, radical kinship with Palestinians. You know, I think um, I'm not an expert in this, but uh, the way that I think about Palestinian sociality, right, or it, it's structured in many different ways. There's a lot of different contexts that we have to account for <clears throat> in the way that we think of family and community and sociality. In Palestine alone, um, there's different structures of kinship and family between the village and the, you know, village, villages and cities or between Palestinian Bedouins and, <clears throat> excuse me, and, um, and the kind of shifting uh, architectural landscape and design of occupation um, that's changed and decimated a lot of Palestinian traditions, you know, 60 to 70% of Palestinians reside outside of historic Palestine in refugee camps, but also scattered all across the world. So our colonial condition has in many ways altered um, what would we would have considered our, you know, traditional forms of family and, and kinship and so forth. Um, one thing that I can say is that Palestinians um, invite and have for a very long time I mean, the, to use the words from the old Fatah manifestos, invite lovers of freedom everywhere to join the Palestinian struggle, that you are welcome to seek refuge in Palestinian radical and revolutionary thought, traditions, and practices. You are welcome to join this struggle. You're welcome to come to Palestine. And I think that that's something that, um, you know, in many ways, Palestinians have gifted the world, but also have received the reciprocity of the gift of solidarity back, right? Um, and it's also come with a number of challenges for Palestinians, which we should probably schedule another panel to talk about um, the challenges of that solidarity. But the one thing that I can say for folks who um, are trying to, to be in a in, in relationship with Palestinians and with Palestine um, is that um, we are we we want you to know that we are also working on our internal worlds as we are fighting this anti-colonial struggle, right? We are trying so hard to rekindle bonds of family who have been dispersed from one another, to fight mounting crisis of new dispossessions and new catastrophes, to bring Palestinians together who are scattered in different places. We're still struggling with a gatekeeper political authority that's put its hands with um, you know, with Zionist settler colonialism. And so we have so many internal things that we're dealing with to sort of maintain our survival as a people and the survival of our political struggle. And sometimes that means that we just have to be open about that with our co-strugglers because of the patience that sometimes we need from them and because of the support for us to create the organizing and social space as Palestinians um, that is necessary in light of all of the ruptures um, to our social and political fabric that we've experienced over the last several decades. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, I'm going to, um, well, this is actually two questions by uh, Ashjan Ajur. Uh, thank you, Lubna, for your inspiring contribution, your point on perceiving the Palestinian struggle 
as the global decolonial struggle in terms of knowledge and practice brings to our mind the discourse of the Palestinian freedom fighters who emphasized that the Palestinian struggle is linked to the struggle of what they call the revolutionaries of the world. Do you think this idea of revolutionaries of the world and thinking Palestine from a global lens would extend the pioneering conceptions of both Franz Fanon and Edward Said of nationalism and its international universal dimension? And then secondly, given that the Palestinian political cause is in its core a universal human struggle, how this understanding of global dimension and the intersection of international struggle provide us with a framework of revolutionary humanism, which is implicit in both Fanon and Said's writings. Um, that's a beautiful question. Thank you, Ashton. Um, I will start off by saying that I think um, one of the one of the one of the areas that I think is underexplored in both our academic work on Palestine and our and our organizing work on Palestine is that there's always a default assumption that third world national liberation movements were in alliance with one another through these internationalist coalitions and, um, and organizing, um, and that they had exchanges with one another about what, you know, an expression of their demands or an expression of their strategies. But what I found in kind of looking back to the, pal the formation of the Palestinian um, national liberation movement is that the Palestinian national movement was only ever made possible from deep study reflection and lessons drawn from other um, anti-colonial struggles of the world, whether that be Vietnam, Cuba, Algeria, especially, um, and so forth. And so what that means from the very get-go is that the nationalism of what was the anti-colonial nationalism that was produced as Palestinians was never actually really nationalist. It was first internationalist before it was ever nationalist. Um, we are in a moment that um, structures of organizing are very different than the 50s and 60s. We do not have nation states as the vanguard of you know, an anti-colonial struggle. Um, we live you know, in a very capitalist world order. Um, and we're living in a moment where we really need to center a reflection on a lot of the tragic mishaps of those movements and how maybe how they ended up in the places that they did was you know, um, inscribed in some of their ideologies and practices from the onset. So um, I do think that the Palestinian struggle um, is a global struggle in the sense that um, it relies on the liberation of all lands and people. And it's also a global struggle because Zionism functions outside of Palestine, right? Um, there's been a weaponization of Zionist violence, censorship, um, participation in the global arms trade, policing, militarization, the counterterrorism um, regime of the world globally. So um, yeah, that's just a as short of an answer as I could give right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm uh, apologies to uh, those of you who post questions, but unfortunately we've run out of time. So um, before saying um, goodbye and thank you, I'll just hand over to uh, Ruba to say a few concluding words. Thank you, Nadia. I. I think we have had a wonderful panel where really I was gifted with a lot of uh, very insightful and uh, novel ways of thinking about issues that I've, I've only started myself to grapple with. And so I also wanted to thank the audience and um, I can see from, I just now switched on the list of attendees and I can see so that some a lot of our friends and, 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 and colleagues and comrades are, are there and could have, uh, it would have been an amazing event to just include everyone in this conversation. And so it's, it's uh, probably for the next time. Mm -hmm. But I really think that uh, this should be the beginning of um, a series of conversations around uh, rethinking Palestine via intersectional um, struggles, but also um, what I take away is also like the really uh, interesting um, ways in which the audience has engaged the discussion by bringing yet another level of complexity around uh, corporate higher education and uh, identities and uh, belonging and loss and, uh, um, and redefinition of cultural practices and kinship across yeah. a variety of contexts. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Nadia and uh, Barbara again. And thank you, Lubna and Miriam for uh, your invaluable 
inputs today. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I just wanted to flag, I mean, in the spirit of this just being the beginning or, you know, not, is this is not the beginning because there have been so many conversations before and after. I would all hope that you will all join us as well in April when our third um, Mahmoud Darwish uh, fellow in Palestinian studies will join us actually on campus, but we'll also be streaming live. This is Professor Nura Arakad and she'll pick up some of the issues um, in her work and she'll give also a, a lecture and then we'll have a panel. So I hope all of you will join us then as well. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, thank you, Ruba. Thank you, Lubna, Miriam, and thanks to the audience and hope to see you soon.